It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Tamberlin. Uh, he's a professor, Agri, Agri Life Research Fellow and Presidential Impact Fellow in the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M University. He is also the director of the Forensic Investigative Science Program at Texas A&M University and principal investigator of the Forensic Laboratory for in Investigative Entomological Sciences Facility at Texas A&M. His research efforts for the past 20 years have been developing methods for production of alternative protein sources for use as livestock, poultry, and aquaculture, aquaculture feed from, from those resources. Predominantly, predominantly, he worked uh, on black soldier fly. Since arriving at Texas A&M University in 2002, he had 15 PhD and 20 uh, master students. Uh, to date, he published eight books, 20, uh, 28 book chapters and over 180 articles and, and have been cited over 10,000 times. It's a great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jeff Tamberlin, please, uh, please uh, share with us uh, your presentation. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, Delari, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate the invitation to be here today, especially with such great speakers. Uh, Dr. Lou, you did a great job, and I'm going to probably reiterate some things that you said and maybe um, expand a little bit in some different directions. Um, what a great time to be speaking about insects as food and feed, especially considering that right now in the United States, the 17-year year cicada emergence is taking place, and there's lots of uh, articles being published on that. Trillions of cicadas are expected to emerge. In fact, there was an article just published in the Washington Post that said that you could eat cicadas and they, they gave recipes on how to do so. Um, the title of my presentation, Fat Boys Are Back, gives me a chance to talk about insect fat, but specifically about black soldier flies, while also paying homage to my youth and the um, great rap group that uh, was real popular in the 80s, the Fat Boys, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, secondly, the third thing I want to point out is that I am not an expert on fats. I'm going to talk some about it. Uh, our other speakers are much more, uh, have more expertise in those areas. But in, ter <clears throat> in terms of the work I'm doing, James Wallen and Mark Richards at the University of Wisconsin are doing work on fats. And this is two individuals that I collaborate with, and they're co-authoring this paper with me. They provided some information for me to present today. So like I said, the Fat Boys, that's a famous band from the 80s, and uh, what a great time to talk about that in terms of their reference of who they are, but from regards of the black soldier fly, because when we talk about black soldier flies, we mostly focus on protein production. Uh, you don't hear a lot of discussion about the fat associated, about the, associated with them, but they're in a, a massive amount of resource that's available that could be used in a lot of different ways, and I'm going to talk about some of those ways in a minute. So this is the adult black soldier fly, Hermesia lucens. Um, this fly it originated from the uh, South America area and it's expanded throughout North America and through globalization it's now um, throughout the world. So wherever people are, basically this fly is present. Uh, the larvae are really where we want to focus our effort because uh, these larvae can be quite high in protein and fat and you can produce a lot of them very fast. And, you know, when we talk about insects as food and feed, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but can you really produce it at a level? that can really be engaging as a commodity around the world. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of data about that as well. And I think I can uh, demonstrate that this insect is in fact industrialized. So why are we doing it? So this was brought up in the presenta previous presentation. I'm gonna emphasize it a little more. The main point that we're focused on is we got one world in which we live, we have limited resources, but we're, our human population is growing exceptionally fast, but it's not just people. It's also the livestock that we produce and our pets that are all competing for resources that people need. So how do we adjust our production and agriculture to meet those demands? Well, one idea is that we can free up resources that we would typically give to livestock or to our pets that can then be used by humans. And the reason that's important is because we have extremely limited resources. Uh, one, agriculture is already responsible for, the quarter, for a quarter of the greenhouse gases produced in the world. Uh, secondly, a third of the land that's available for agriculture is already being used uh, for livestock production. And also when we think about um, water use, a tremendous amount of the water that we have available to us 
is being used for livestock production or agricultural production. At the same time, when we think about just one industry, aquaculture and the production of uh, fish or farm fish, uh, it's having a big impact on our international fisheries. Uh, they're being depleted. There's no other way to say it. It's not sustainable. And we have to find alternate ways of feeding these animals in captivity so that we can produce the, the uh, fish and other seafood products that we want at a level that is sustainable. Compounded by that is we waste a lot of food. So 30 to 40% of the food that we produce in the world isn't used. It either remains in a field or it's not consumed and thrown away. And that's not good either because that's going to produce greenhouse gas, potentially pollute the environment, and it's just not efficient. So there's a lot of work being done on how to use insects as part of a circular economy to make us more efficient uh, in terms of the resources we have available, but also protected the resources we have uh, at our fingertips, i.e. land, air, and water. The black soldier fly answers a lot of these questions. This is the adult Hermesia lucens. Uh, the family uh, black soldier fly, Stratiomyde, is a quite, quite a large family, uh, over 2,000 species. Uh, it's a big family, but there's only one species that we want to focus on, that's Hermesia lucens. So when people talk about soldier flies, they should be talking about this species, but it's more complex than that. We won't get into the complexities of it, but what some people think they're producing is Hermesia lucens, it probably is not Hermesia lucens. But because of the ability of this insect to consume just about anything organic, the larvae consume just about anything organic and keep it out of the landfill, companies are popping up all over the world. Evo conversion systems in the US, AgriProtein in South Africa, Intopro, Terra, Prodix, Enviroflight, the list goes on and on. And what we're seeing now is that other companies are starting to engage this industry. Groups like uh, Filio out of France, it's focused on the um, nutrition aspects of livestock produce, production. Can these insects be produced to harvest unique minerals or vitamins or proteins or even fats that can then be used as ingredients for other livestock? And then we also have groups that are like Tyson, uh, Cargill, some of these larger companies that are interested in the feed side of things, uh, but also the livestock production. But globally, uh, there are a number of companies that mass produce this insect. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the mass production in a second. So one thing to recognize is that the life cycle of this insect is fairly fast. Um, if you were to look at its development, it's 14 days. Uh, but some companies like Evo Conversion Systems has it down to seven days. So they are able to do it twice as fast as anybody in the world. Um, but that's a fast life cycle. So if you think about land use and crop production, uh, you get one cycle a year with this insect at two week intervals, you get 26 crops per year. So you can go vertical with the system too. So you can um, massively overproduce uh, insect based protein or insect biomass uh, on a single hectare of land that would just dwarf uh, what can be done with trad traditional live, um, row crops. So can this be maximized and produced at a level that's actually relevant to the livestock uh, industry. Yes, it can. Uh, some of the companies that are out there uh, can do this. I've been to facilities that can do this in China. They can digest 100 tons of waste a day with this insect, 100 tons of waste. That'll yield 20 to 30 tons of larvae, which will yield 7 to 10 tons of dry product. If we assume that 50% of that is protein, then obviously you can do the math, three and a half to five tons of insect protein per day. And the same could be see, said for the fat as well. But something that's really important about this insect is it's extremely sustainable. Uh, because of the sustainability, the fact that it can eat just about anything that's considered quote unquote waste uh, is a huge boon for the use of this insect. Secondly, it's not known to be a pest species. This fly is very short lived. It lives to mate and lay eggs and then it dies. It's actually quite beneficial. It digests waste and it kills pathogens such as E. coli and salmonella. It can break down uh, toxins like mycotoxins. Uh, so if we think about uh, aflatoxin and maize or groundnut or soy, um, think about how the black soldier fly industry could partner with traditional commodity groups 
they can take the black soldier fly can be used to digest and remediate and recycle contaminated products to produce products of value. Because of its benefits and its use and the fact that it is not a pest, it is uh, actually approved for use as a feed ingredient in the United States. So AFCO, the regulatory body in the US has approved it uh, for use in poultry, swine, recently with pet food, and of course with aquaculture select species. So in the United States, this insect is the only insect that's approved across the board for use across these categories. So you can mass produce it as long as you follow the guidelines of AFCO and you can use it as a feed ingredient. Uh, this can be used at, to a certain level. It's been approved in the EU. It's also been approved in Canada, Australia, and pretty much the rest of the world for these uses. So it is definitely globalized. But as I mentioned, most of the work is really focused on the protein side of things. So this insect, depending on what you feed them, and we'll talk about tailoring the insect and producing it, um, is mostly focused on the protein side. But again, it, a large part of it is fat. And the reason being is that the adult doesn't need to feed. So it really relies on the fat it accrues during the larval stage. So when it emerges, that's, that's the energy in its tank. So it has a large amount of fat in its body and it can vary depending on what you feed it as Dr. Lou pointed out previously. The amino acid makeup of the insect is uh, pretty unique. Uh, the main two main uh, amino acids I wanted to focus on were lysine and methionine. It's exceptionally high in methionine, uh, which is great considering that methionine is synthetically produced. So for poultry, that's a huge boon. Um, it's, it is lower compared to housefly, but housefly is a pest species. It is a recognized pest species. It's a vector for a number of pathogens. It likes to go in people's homes. So there's just not as much interest in mass producing it, but uh, it can be done. But the black soldier fly is high in these amino acids. As far as um, the uh, fat content, uh, let me change this real quick. Okay, I was trying to move my screen a little bit. Yeah, so as far as the, the fat content, uh, they rely on, the, the larvae rely on these reserves so that the adult can survive and reproduce. But overall, the body fat of the, the black soldier fly larva is 10 to 33% fat on a dry matter basis, depending on how they're raised. And that's critical because if you're feeding them waste, what you feed them will impact what they are. So you wanna tailor the diet so that you can maximize the production of whatever fat content you're looking for, whatever type of fat you want. Uh, as a feed ingredient, uh, black soldier flies are often evaluated on that protein and rather than fat. So a lot of these companies, they'll produce black soldier flies and they'll harvest the protein and then they're left with the fat. And you don't hear a lot of discussion about how they're using it. There is an interest in it um, as previously outlined and you're gonna learn more about that, but how we use it is still remains to be defined. Uh, previously discussed, if you look at the uh, fatty acid profiles, uh, there's a number of studies that demonstrate that what they're comprised of can vary. Now, this isn't necessarily based on the genetics of the fly or the population specifically being tested. It is important. It really does come down to what you're feeding them. So when we look at the black soldier fly as a whole, the saturated fats form about 50% or more of the fat composition of the black soldier fly. So if this is an angle that you're looking at, this is what you're interested in. That's what a benefit of the black soldier fly would be. Uh, the unsaturated fatty acids dominated by two particular ones that were previously discussed. So again, these two fatty acids make up a large portion of what's in the black soldier fly. And again, as I've mentioned before, and just to reiterate the point is that the fat is heavily dependent on the dietary fat. So what is it fed? And we did some work back in the early 2000s where we um, fed black soldier flies fish offal. So we mixed it with actual dairy manure and we showed that we could manipulate the fat content of the black soldier fly. And I'm gonna show that in a minute. But what we do know is that the black soldier fly can be used as a feed ingredient. So this is just an example, um, a few examples of where black soldier flies were integrated into the diet of uh, different animals. And what we see is that in most cases, like in this case uh, with the Jean carp, 
where they use black soldier fly oil as 100% replacement, we got they got similar growth patterns as you would see if you were using more traditional fat resources. So it could be served as a replacement to like soybean oil in that case. Uh, with broiler chickens, uh, using the fats, what we see is there's no dietary impact on final weight or daily weight gain. And we see that saturated fatty acids content increase in the chicken by 11%. So it does change the, the composition of the animal that's produced a certain level. So feed formulations still need some work to maximize production so the chickens or other livestock being produced meet the requirements of the company. And uh, as mentioned, rainbow trout is another area. And this was another study, not from us, a decade after our work, but uh, they found that there was no dietary effect when using the fats for raising rainbow trout. In terms of the quality of the meat, this is with chicken breast muscle. Um, they were using it as a replacement or a comparison to soybean meal. And you can see that they did different levels of introduction and there was no effect on the uh, color. Uh, and drip loss and pH were unaffected. So it did not affect the chicken uh, muscle in that regard. When looking at rabbits and two particular muscles in the rabbit, uh, what they found is that lipid oxidation was less in the rabbit muscle when they were fed black soldier fly. And then back with chicken muscle, um, this is just another study showing that there was no dietary effect when using black soldier flies as a feed ingredient. And just to elaborate, elaborate a little more, um, there have been some benefits associated with the health of the animals when fed black soldier flies. So it's increased their immunity uh, and it's increased feed conversion rates. So there are many benefits to using black soldier flies as a, a feed ingredient. Uh, this is part of the work that we did back in the early uh, the 2000s, where we looked at how to integrate black soldier flies into the diet. Um, of Rainbow trout and what we wanted to see is if we could tailor the insect to be a certain uh, nutritional quality. And what we found is that when we did include fish offal in the diet of the black soldier flies, we could enhance their fatty acid composition. And that's really fascinating because that, what that means is we can really tailor a diet to produce an insect that we want. Uh, some more recent work that we did, and we're working on this paper right now, is we showed that we can use different fatty acids to manipulate not just their nutritional content, but their development time. So we can really tailor the diet, not just for tailoring the insect and what its quality is, but how it's produced. And in this case, we use different fatty acids. And what we showed is that we can change the duration of larval development. And that really affected the pupil outcome. So size is not everything. Um, in this case, we could change the size. This graph on the right is just showing mean pupil weight over time and age of the larvae. And that, depending on the fatty acids used, you could produce a bigger larva or a smaller larva, larva. But sometimes what that would result in is greater concentrations of select fatty acids. So in summary, um, the black soldier fly is approved for use as a feed ingredient. Uh, it's a growing industry globally and it can be mass produced. Hundreds of ton, a hundred ton of waste today digestion is not unreal. Um, it's most work on black soldier fly is focused on protein production and little is known about the fat. So this is what's great about this uh, opportunity today to talk about it is that there's just not as much known about it. Now I wanna shift gears real quick because if you're interested in a black soldier fly, if you're interested in insects mass production, I just want to uh, mention a little bit of work that we're doing. Uh, we're currently uh, forming what's called an NSF uh, IUCRC on insects as food and feed. And this is a partnership between IUPUI and Mississippi State University. And this is the website for the National Science Foundation program. And here's my email address if you wanna learn more about it. But the way these centers work is they engage industry. So if industry, if you're, paying, if you're watching this and you're interested in learning more about the industry and you wanna partner, uh, it's low investment, high return. I'd be glad to share with you information about the center. It is a great opportunity to train people to work for your company. And it works across the systems. We're working with black soldier fly, mealworm, and cricket, and other insect species as well. And this is a list of the companies that have committed to being part of the center right now. And uh, we plan on having our first meeting in the fall. And if you're interested in learning more about it, send me an email. I'll be glad to tell you about it. With that, thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Tamberlin, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have time for a few questions. And the first question uh, is, are the toxic factors detected in such fats since they are fed on waste? So I'm going to speak more when we say toxic or toxin. Uh, what we know is that if you feed them a waste that has like aflatoxin, they will break it down and it's not in the insects. They, they can actually degrade it. Heavy metals are a concern depending on what you feed them because it will accrue in their exoskeleton, but that's in their exoskeleton, which means that you could squeeze the, the insect like a grape, harvest the protein and do different things. So as a bioremediator, black soldier fly could be a good way to use it. We've used this for a variety of different things. I could tell you about work we did for the Department of Defense where we were looking at bioremediation of toxic landscapes. So black soldier fly can do it, but you definitely want to test and follow core protocols on quality assurance. With bacteria or pathogens, they kill E. coli. Black soldier fly will kill out E. coli. Salmonella, they'll, just, they'll reduce it or remove it from the substrate, but it does... Uh, it is detectable in the insect. So if you were to use it and you're worried about salmonella, you would have to do some work for um, remediating that in the insect biomass. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, a previous question to Dr. Liu was this idea of oxidation. So one thing about black soldier flies that's fascinating is somehow they stabilize these fatty acids and they don't go rancid for long periods of time. So how they do that, we don't know. But if we could figure that out, that would be a huge patent, wouldn't it be? That's good, thank you. Uh, next question is, have you looked at sterol, cholesterol and phospholipid composition? So we have not, and I'm hoping that Daylon, she can talk about this and she may have some information on this more than I do. So I'm not sure, but that is a great question uh, that needs to be explored without a doubt. Sounds good. And... Uh... Are both protein and oil approved in U.S. as feed ingredients? So the insect as a whole is approved. So AFCO has not gone into the specifics on that. Right now, they just say the whole insect. But AFCO is moving fast on black soldier fly. There's lots of things in the pipeline with them. And it would not surprise me if companies um, are not pushing for that. Because that's the whole thing is we need to figure out how to break the insect down into the parts. And if we look at economic theory, the sum of the parts is definitely greater than a whole. And I think that's something that's going to be driven soon. And I think we'll see that. Sounds good. Thank you. And, uh, oh, you will be happy to hear this question. Can African startups benefit or collaborate with uh, NSF Center? Without a doubt. Uh, send me an email. I'll be glad to tell you uh, some of the companies that are listed. One in particular, some of you may know, is Sanergy out of Kenya. Um, they are part of the center. Uh, they are wanting to be part of the center moving forward. So there are opportunities and the center is truly global. Uh, we want to be a resource for everybody. Wonderful. Wonderful. With that, uh, let's pause. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamberlin, for answering the question. Let's pause and, uh, uh, and hear our Dr. Dylan Tsongpa uh, presentation, and then we will have our panel for uh, for rest of the questions. <laughs>